Disclaimer, this podcast is not in any way affiliated with Universal, DreamWorks, or Big Idea Entertainment. All opinions discussed belong to the person sharing their views and may not reflect on our personal beliefs. And with that, enjoy the show. Welcome back to another episode of the What's the Big Idea podcast, the podcast that interviews former associates of Big Idea Productions to talk about life before, during, and after Veggie Tales. One of the beautiful things about finding all of these people is knowing all of the crazy projects they have partaken in. This man had a small yet memorable role while on VeggieTales, but has had his hand or his voice in many commercials, producing vocals for some of the biggest TV shows, all of that while remaining a cool and humble person. The man that I'm referring to is none other than Jeff Morrow. Known as the voice of Palmy the Palm Tree in God Wants Me to Forgive Them and A Very Veggie Christmas, he's been part of a legendary legacy that I invite all of you to see. Here is Jeff Morrow. Thanks, Mr. Morrow, for joining us on this podcast and for your work as well. Hi there. How are you today? I'm pretty good. And before we get into the interview, I want to ask you for all the lovely people who are listening to this. Who are you? Who am I? I am an actor, a singer, a vocal producer, vocal coach, vocal arranger, voiceover actor. I do several things and I've done them for a very long time. My name is Jeff Morrill. All right. So before we get into the nitty gritty details of what this podcast is about, every professional player in the industry has a story. And that story starts all the way back into childhood. So what was your childhood like, Mr. Morrow? I come from a family of two boys and one girl. My parents migrated from Tennessee and Arkansas north during the early 50s. So my father could work in the steel mills in Gary in East Chicago, Indiana, right outside of Chicago. My parents, J.W. Morrow, who was deceased. My mother just passed a year and a half ago, Chloe T. Morrow. She worked for Indiana Bell at the time, which is AT&T now. So both, I come from a middle-class, hardworking, upbringing, and a hardworking kind of family with a solid uh, go-to-church kind of upbringing. And uh, we lived in a little town, Hammond, which is right outside of uh, Chicago. It's a suburb of Chicago. I was uh, always very heavily involved in musical activities. When I was in school, I was in the choir, always in the band, in elementary school, and moving to high school also, I was in band and Matter of fact, I was the president of the band and I was over a lot of the sectionals and things in choir in high school. So I was a typical music guy in school. And I'm very thankful those things were available to me at that time because I can't imagine my life in school without those things, without having music available. So I'm very thankful for that. What musical activities did you specifically do during your time in childhood? In childhood, I was in my church choir in Hammond. I also eventually started playing for my church choir, playing piano for the choir, and also a neighborhood uh, choir at that time. In school, I sang in barbershop quartet, I sang in concert choir, I sang in boys ensemble, and I played trombone in the band, in concert band and marching band. So I was very, very musical, very involved. As a child, I was always, my, my parents always played a lot of older R&B stuff, Brooke Benton, Diana Washington, Diana Ross, Aretha Franklin. So I was always exposed to a lot of really good R&B and soul music. And I started listening to more pop and rock stuff a little later in life. But I've always had uh, music in my household growing up. And I always uh, found myself trying to listen and learn. And at an age about 11, I was visiting my cousin. They had a piano at their house, and I just realized, hey, I can kind of figure out stuff. I've got a musical ear. I don't know how this happened because I come from a family of basically no musicians. <laughs> so it was always strange to me that I was able to, you know, just start, start kind of picking up melodies and picking up uh, harmonies and chord progressions. And so my mother enrolled me in piano lessons at that time, my sister and my brother, all three of us, but I was the only one that was really interested in it and stuck with it. So that's how I got really started in music. What can you tell us about your home church, the very first one that you were part of? 
Bethel AME Church in Hammond, Indiana. It was a little small church with a very small congregation. My fondest memories are sitting next to my mother who couldn't carry a tune, God bless her, couldn't carry a tune in a bucket, and her sister, my Aunt Dorothy, who was about the same, listening to them sing along with the choir. And I'm thinking, boy, is this bad. Uh, <laughs> So those are some of the fondest memories, especially now with my mom not with us anymore. It's you know it's a very fond memory for me. What would you say besides that specific memory was like a staple childhood memory that you always like? Just how great of a family and extended family I had and still have. I, you know I have cousins that were a big influence on me. I have an older cousin who is very famous and successful entrepreneur now, who I think shaped a lot of my childhood. He was two years older than than I am always watched how he dealt with people and handled people and talked with people and handled himself in public. And that helped me a lot as I got older in high school, college, after college, as a studio singer, studio musician, and things like that. That's one of my fondest memories, watching my family and watching them dealing with people and, and hearing some of the stories that they would, you know, tell about, you know, their childhood and their upbringing. My father didn't have uh, much of an education. He had to drop out of school in the sixth grade and worked at several jobs to help with his family at the time. So those things really shaped me and watching how my father at that point worked in the steel mill in East Chicago, Indiana, Inland Steel, watched how he never, never missed work. He just, he wasn't feeling well, he went to work. He had a headache, he went to work. He was tired, he went to work. And I think that work ethic really rubbed off on me no matter what I was going to do, I knew I was going to be a hard worker at it, and I knew I was going to be persistent at it, and I knew I was going to be dedicated to it. My mom was the same way, very hard worker. I watched her go to work every day. That has rubbed off on me, and those are some of my really fond memories growing up. What can you tell us about being a band kid during your high school years? <laughs> you mean the, me and being classified as the nerdy band kids? It's interesting because you're classified as, oh, well, he's not really cool because he's uh, playing trombone in the band. Later on, when I got to high school and I was playing keyboards in bands and singing, then all of a sudden I was a little cooler. So I really appreciated band, choir, barbershop quartet, and the ensembles that I sang in, in choir. It's interesting. I really got interested in singing when I was in seventh grade. I had a teacher, Jacqueline Buss, who... I still, I'm still in contact with now. We talk all the time and I visited her a, a couple of months ago. She was the first person to ever tell me, you know, you, you have a really real gift. You know, you, this might be something that you can do. So I went from seventh grade to eighth grade. And then when I went to high school, she ended up moving to the high school and she was the choir director of the high school. And she saw me in the hall and she said, you need to get in the choir. This is where you need to be. And she's always been a force in my life and uh, just uh, giving me that diversity of music that I was able to draw on later in my career. When I got out of college and graduated with a degree in voice and I started doing commercials and records and stuff in Chicago. It was a big plus that I was really aware of so many different styles of music. And that came from high school and college, junior high school, high school and college, just the diversity of, of music that she gave me. And I really appreciate that. And I, I thank her for that every day. And grateful you should be because she was right in talking about how incredible of a voice that you've got. Oh, thank you. Just talking to you right now, it just, it kind of feels like one step a little bit lower than Morgan Freeman about how everyone talks about how he's the voice of God. Right. Well, uh, I, I would say you're a close, pretty close second, you know. Thank you. Thank you. It's, it's, it's served me well for many, many years now. And I have no doubt that it will continue to serve you for many more years. Did you have any other interests aside from music? I was also involved in sports. I ran track and cross country and I played little league and little league baseball. And I was okay. I wasn't standout athlete in any of those areas. But I decided when I was a freshman in high school that it was time to really start focusing on music. So even though I was still playing sports and still running track all through school, I decided to, when I had free time, that I was sitting at a piano. I was trying to understand harmony. I was trying to understand chord progressions, listen to songs. I was a huge Stevie Wonder fan when I got to college and later in high school. I was always listening to Stevie Wonder and trying to figure out, okay, how did he come up with these progressions and how does one relate to the other? So things like that. But I started getting out of the, the sports thing and focusing more on music, even though I, you know, I've always played like basketball at home and with my friends and things like that. But my main interest was 
music. And I can remember, it's so funny, I can remember some of my, not close friends, but some of my friends that I grew up with saying, man, you know, we're out in the streets playing ball and we want you to come out here, but you, you know, sitting at the piano, you know, I was like, yeah, well, that's what I want to do right now. I've never been one that bowed to peer pressure. If there was something I want to do, that's what I was going to do. And no matter what anyone said, that wasn't going to deter me from working on what I wanted to work on. What can you tell us about your college years? College years. My freshman year, I had a voice scholarship to Bradley University in Peoria, Illinois. I went there. That was kind of my first time away from home. Didn't deal with it too well. I was kind of like in shock. I didn't know anyone there at the school. Being on scholarship, I was in the Bradley Corral, I think it was called. Yeah, the Bradley Corral. So I was with all these other scholarship singers. It was a little stressful to me being out of my element, not having any of my friends around, but I kind of adjusted to it throughout the year. But I started to notice that even though I asked for, I was trying to get a better understanding of my voice, specifically asked for a male teacher at the time. I'll, I'll never forget this. The college basically told me no. I said, well, I'm, you know, I want to get a better understanding of my register and how to deal with my voice. They said, no, we don't have anyone available. You need to stick with. And I said, okay. And during a break, I auditioned for a voice scholarship at Valparaiso University, Valparaiso, Indiana. And I ended up leaving Bradley after my freshman year and going to Valparaiso University because they guaranteed I would have a male instructor. And I did. His name was Joseph McCall. And I had him for all the years I was at Valparaiso University. And I learned a ton about my voice. I learned how to manipulate it from R&B to pop to classical. And I was able to use that throughout my career and still use it you know, now. So that was a big thing for me, getting a male vocal teacher so I ended up graduating with a degree in music education, emphasis in voice from Valparaiso University. You being a very big music major, what would you say is probably the hardest facets of music to, to study? And I guess we could kind of split that into a two-way question, one about the musical side of things, and then the other side being about voice more specifically. Hmm. Well, classical was always very interesting, and it's very hard. I started voice lessons privately when I was 14 or 15, my mom started me and I was studying some classical. So I had a, an idea of classical voice, but I really didn't have a grasp of it. And I wanted to be more familiar with, with classical voice because you know, I, I was around R and B and I was around pop and stuff all the time, but I felt, okay, I just want to, I want to get a better understanding of this. So I started taking voice lessons at, at 14 from Catherine Fayo in, in Hammond, Indiana. And that helped me with the auditioning process for getting college scholarships. But, you know, classical voice is, is not easy. It's rough and it's very disciplined. As a matter of fact, when I graduated from college, right before I graduated, I got hired at the Lyric Opera in Chicago for the chorus there. So I graduated from high school and I accepted a teaching job teaching at a middle school music. And I was also working at the Lyric Opera in Chicago in the chorus. And on top of <laughs> On top of that, I was playing with a top 40 band five nights a week in clubs and had two church choirs that I was playing for and teaching. So that gave me even broader perspective on music and broader understanding of music. But I realized at the Lyric Opera in Chicago, I was like, okay, this is interesting. This is cool. And I was being paid to sing in these big productions. I worked in, you know, Rigoletto with Luciano Pavarotti. I was in a bunch of shows there, performances there at Lyric Opera, but I did several things. But I started to realize, I was like, you know, I can't really make the kind of living that I want to make and generate the kind of income that I want to generate working here. So how can I use this, all this musical knowledge that I have, how can I use all that to generate more income in a different part of business? And that's when I stumbled into commercials. And that was the perfect move for me. So you mentioned that you were working on your voice. What would you say is your reference for doing your voice? When I talk about understanding my voice, I wanted to understand how to bring, I had, I had natural resonance in the, in the lower part of my voice. And I wanted an understanding of how to bring that resonance throughout my voice. And when you work with a really good music teacher, a vocal coach, they can work exercises to get you to understand 
first of all, the different partials in your voice and the different areas in your voice and how to strengthen the voice and how to solidify the range. And that's what I wanted to do. And that's what I really learned in college. And I was able to then take the job at the Lyric and feel confident that I'm not going to get in there sounding like an R&B singer singing in a, <laughs> at the Lyric Opera Chicago. So I just wanted a better understanding of how to bring resonance throughout my voice and support. So out of college, working at a theater, doing church part-time, and then realizing that perhaps this wasn't exactly what I wanted to be. What can you tell us about that transition to doing voices? It's funny. When I got into commercials, I was very successful right off the bat. So I was teaching junior high school, sixth, seventh, and eighth grade choir, general music. While I was working in some of these, one of these top 40 bands playing clubs at night, a guy came into one of the clubs. His name was Jerry Liliadow. He was just happened to be there and he was a friend of the lead singer in the band that I was working with. I was a keyboard player and singer. He came up to me on a break and he said, have you ever thought about doing commercials? He said, your voice is perfect for commercials. And you have a very vast understanding of different styles. And I said, no, I never thought about it because I actually had never thought about that people do voices on commercials, whether it's voiceover or whether it's singing. I just, for some reason, had never given it a thought and just figured, oh, that just come, that's just how it is. So I don't, I don't know where I thought it came from, but it turns out he owned a production company in Chicago and did commercials. And that's how I got introduced into the commercial business in Chicago. He invited me, he said, you know, I'd just come in and, and listen sometime, just come in and sit in the studio and listen to sessions and see how it works with singers and voice actors. And so I did that, but I was teaching five days a week at the middle school I was working at. After a couple of months of that, he hired me on a session and said, okay, I want you to sing on this session. And it was interesting. It was a session in the early eighties and it was, you can still find it on YouTube. It's a uh, Ronald McDonald skating around an ice pond and the singers are doing oohs and ahs to the old McDonald's jingle. You deserve a break today. And there were seven singers on the session. There were two sopranos, there were two altos, there were two tenors, and there was one bass, me. And I remember being in the session, not having any idea that these were some of the top singers in the country. And I didn't know, so I'm just this kid from Hammond. I don't, I don't what do I know? I'm just there to sing this job and read the music and sing the job. Looking at the chart, I noticed that one note didn't seem to go with the rest of the harmony, one of the notes that I had. And I pointed out to the producer, I asked the producer a question. I said, is this, sh should this note here actually be uh, whatever it is? I said, it looks like it's wrong. And he said, oh yeah, you're, you're right. That, that's right. That one question caught the attention of the other singers who didn't know me, didn't care to know me at the time, really. <laughs> but at that point, all of a sudden they were interested. And when they heard me sing bass parts and blend with the group, then all of a sudden they were like, oh, okay, this guy knows what he's doing. So one of them was a contractor in Chicago who contracted most of the vocal sessions in Chicago. His name is Bob Bowker. And Bob is a really good friend of mine, even till to, to today. And he started hiring me on more sessions. So now I have a dilemma. I can't teach every day and do sessions at the same time every day. So I got called in from my principals, got called into the principal's office at the middle school, Eggers Middle School. And she said, okay, it's time. You gotta, <laughs> you gotta make a decision. Are you gonna be a session singer or are you gonna be a junior high school music teacher? And I remember saying, I gotta go. I gotta move on. And it's funny being on those commercial sessions and singing opened up the door for me doing voiceovers because I would just respond to people. They would ask a question and the client in the room would hear my voice and go, oh, this guy has a great voice. Can he read this? And that's how it started. One thing that I just picked up just talking to you in just these handful of moments is just how nice it is that you just remember your roots so much and you can bring out people and specific locations and stuff like that. Just thanking all of the, the people that have influenced you because not many people who reach any sort of success, you know, they forget, often forget the people who helped build them up. But you're the exact opposite where you can remember that specific person in that specific time in your life. It's great to meet somebody who's 
of great humbleness and great modesty. Thank you. You know, that's why now I try to help as many people as I can because people helped me. And I don't look at it as, as a negative. Okay, I'm going to help this person now. They're going to put me out of work. No, I'm going to help this person. And if something happens later on down the road where they have to refer somebody, they might refer me for something. But I've helped a lot of young people in the business and I continue to do that. And it's just the way I was raised and just the, the way I believe things should work. I'm not out here trying to block anybody's blessing because that's going to block mine. I'm not trying... <laughs> I'm just trying to be uh, open. And if someone is talented, they're talented. And if I can help them, then I can help them. Yeah. So we could definitely use a lot more Jeff Marus in our society. And I think the world would be a much better place. <laughs> but before we start, before I ask some more questions about your voiceover gigs, your brief stint as a middle school music teacher, do you have any fun memories, any students that you remember or any cool little pieces of that part of your life that you want to share or no? I have so many students that I remember because they are all friends with me on Facebook and Instagram. It's funny, they're in their 50s now. And so they're always, hey, Mr. Morrow. I was like, Mr. Morrow? <laughs> But they're always reaching out to me to say hi. And, and I'm watching their, you know, the videos and things of their kids. And they would go, you know, I wish my my kid had a music teacher like I had in junior high school. And then they'll talk about it's just such a good feeling for hearing them talk about the things that I did with them in junior high, doing Thriller and doing, you know, Guys and Dolls and, and them going, you know, yeah, I remember you teaching us all the moves to Thriller. And I was like, yeah, well, you know, it was, it was fun. That's and that's what we did back at that time. Well, that's what I did because I wanted my job to be fun and I wanted to have fun and let them enjoy music and learn. A lot of music teachers were doing some of the same old things they were doing with me coming up in school. And I found that some of these young urban kids were bored stiff. So I was like, how can I twist this a little bit that they're going to be interested in music and they're going to want to want to be in this class and they're going to want to learn. So I started twisting things a little bit and doing things that were a little unorthodox for music teachers back in the 80s. And, you know, some teachers loved it. Some didn't like it. I didn't care. The students enjoyed it and they were learning. And that's what, what I was concerned. So, yeah, I have plenty of memories and I talk to a lot of those students still all the time and talk about their kids and what we did back then. You know, this reminds me of this one Cartoon Network show that was done by Andre 3000. I don't know if you've heard of it. It's quite obscure. It's called Class of 3000, where Andre 3000, he voices, and I think he actually created the series, but he voices this music teacher that is trying to make this class of students trying to get them engaged with music. And it seems like to me that you are basically the real life parallel <laughs> of sounds, that cartoon. It sounds like that. You know, it's so funny. There's a couple of guys that I see on Instagram now that have their elementary school students singing, you know, Earth, Wind and Fire and these songs. And I go, you know, I was doing that back in 79 and 80. I was doing fun stuff like that. But that was a way to get those kids engaged. And now all of a sudden they're interested. It's not like, OK, we're singing this boring stuff and I'm going to be a problem in class because I'm bored. No, we're singing things that were interesting to them. And I could still get them to learn the same music theory things that I wanted them to learn, but just in, in a way that was fun to them. So, yeah, it was it was fun. But getting back to your voiceover session, I mean, you said that you've done over six thousand six thousand commercials in your lifetime which is absolutely i've done way more than that i've probably done ten thousand by now all right that's the number increases every day but uh it increases every <laughs> time. yeah but i mean you've done so much commercial work and uh it, i would just like for you to just spend some time and just talk about some of the ones that just stick out to you the most wow <laughs> some of the ones that come to mind uh in the 80s there was when the candy bar Twix first came out, we were doing acapella vocal things to Twix. And I was the bass in all the Twix commercials. And I still see them on YouTube and there's nothing to stick. So Twix can't fix. And I was the bass voice. That parlayed into later me becoming the voiceover on the Twix spots, which was one of the first times the, the client just said, hey, he has a good voice. Can you read this? So I remember that fondly. I remember doing the voice of Diggum for Kellogg's Honey Smacks. I can't remember if it was Sugar Smacks at the time or Honey Smacks. And that was when they first had Diggum start talking and rapping. I was the voice of Diggum for those spots. Bowling is right up my alley. Kellogg's Sugar Smacks. Part of this nutritious breakfast. Diggum. I've had a short stint as Tony the Tiger for a campaign, a short campaign. On 
early 80s, one of the very first voiceover things I did was for Kellogg's, not Frosted Flakes, Kellogg's Corn Flakes. And Kellogg's Corn Flakes had the rooster on the box that was Cornelius Rooster jump off the box. And then he would do these things. These, this is way before you guys' time. You would, you would see it. You can find it on YouTube, but you would never remember these. But I was the voice of this gravelly voice guy. Kellogg's Corn Flakes introduces. And it was kind of, and I would set up the the spots for this rooster jumping off the box and doing all these things. <laughs> Part of this complete breakfast. It was a lot of fun, but I, that's when I started kind of experimenting with voices and, and thinking, oh, I never thought about this, but I can kind of do this. And I was always doing it thinking about, okay, this is going to be the voice of one of my uncles. I would think about <laughs> stupid things, or this is my friend, this is the way he talks, so I'm going to do a voice like that. But I ended up doing a ton of things like that. I I was on all the uh, African-American radio spots. I was the the tag guy for McDonald's for about 20 years. McDonald's, prices and participation may vary. Sewers for details, special type of toy for kids under three. McDonald's. And I would do those. It got to the point where I didn't even have to go in the studio. They would just take my McDonald's tags and just throw them on spots. Those are some of the, the fun memories I've done. The Green Giant, I've done that ho oh, oh, ho oh. ho on a few spots. I've done that, but I've done just a, a bunch of things voice wise. Just because I know that some people just need to hear it. Can can we get the dig em? Can we get the dig em line? Dig em, Kenlong's Honey Smacks. You'll be hopping. <laughs> Absolutely, sir. You'll just, just, just <laughs> be hearing all this stuff. But one, one commercial that you did actually quite recently that surprised me, um, I remember seeing it on your Instagram, was the Pokemon commercials. Yeah, they've been popping up every year. I come in and do Pokemon Diamond and Pokemon Pearl. Pokemon Pearl. New from Nintendo. So it's kind of that quirky, another quirky sound. And they call me every six months or so, and then I do a bunch of spots. Yeah, it just, just because uh, I remember, you know, as a kid, watching some of the, the Pokemon shows and some of the commercials that they always had like this one guy with a very specific voice that you can always hear him doing the narration. And then when I heard you, I was like, mm -hmm. I was like, uh, you know, it sounds like a little bit more of a modern take. But then when I found out it was you, Jeff Morrow doing that, I was like, holy crap, like, right. this is insane. Like, wait a minute, they got this old guy, this old guy doing this modern take? <laughs> I mean, my, it wasn't that you were that you were an old guy, but it was just like, you know, Jeff Morrow, you know, who, who kind of spoiling it a little bit, you know, I knew you as a voice of Palmy, you know, just Palmy did Pokemon right. now, but I mean, now just going through all of the commercials that I grew up in my mind and probably people who are going to be watching this soon, just going back and being like, probably Jeff Marr was a lot more involved in your childhood than that we probably remember. That is so true. And you know, that's not the first, I used to do Pokemon years ago. I don't know if you remember Poke, Poke balls when they were falling from the sky on this commercial and the kids looking, looking up in the sky and they see these Pokeballs falling. This is, you know, 15 years ago. I was the voice on that. Pokemon Diamond and Pokemon Pearl. Gotta catch them all. Only for Nintendo DS. Rated E for everyone. And that was Pokemon. And that's, you know, you can find that on YouTube too. I think it's called Pokeballs. Yeah, no, I remember that commercial. Yeah, I remember the, the one where everybody's like looking up at the at the sky and then all the Pokeballs are... Yep, that's me. What, was that for... I'm trying to remember. Was that like for Platinum or something? I think it was a game of some kind. I don't remember. It was some kind of game. And I don't don't really remember. But I, I've done, you know, in some of the, the serial things I've done, not just for Kellogg's, this is before your time also, there was, I used to do all these Batman tie-ins. When Batman got to be big, it started in the 80s, and they started bringing Batman cereal, Batman game, Batman this, Batman tie-in with McDonald's. I did all those things. A honey nut flavored part of your complete breakfast. Batman cereal. Because I had that James Earl Jones sound, you know, if you've always wanted to be Batman, those voices would tie into those spots. And so I'd get hired for all those things. I'm probably just going to have to, like, after this is, I'm going to have to binge like a bunch of commercial spots and be like, is that you? Is that you, Jeff Morrow? <laughs> and just have an absolute blast of reliving all of the crazy, crazy memories. Did you, I don't know if you ever did these, but if you didn't, then it, absolute shame that they didn't think to put you on the Apple Jacks voicing the cinnamon guy. I never did Apple Jacks, and I, I don't. Oh I my god! I did Apple Jacks, 
because that was Chicago. That was all Chicago stuff. All that Kellogg stuff was Chicago. And I don't know who did that. There were there were a few guys that were really big into doing different voices. Joe Corey was huge, and a guy who I just saw passed a few years ago, Larry Moran. He was known as the funny voice man in Chicago, and he did tons. You know, it might have been him. He used to do Toucan Sam and a bunch of other spots. But you know, I was just I always just felt fortunate that I was able to you know kind of slip into that side because this business can be very closed, and you see it once you get in. If you get in, you can start to see okay, there's these 10 guys that are doing everything. There's these 15 guys and they're doing all the spots for this, this, and this, and this. And so since I was around as a singer, the clients were familiar with me and they knew me. Hey, Jeff, how you doing? Oh, how you doing? I would see them on the street on, you know, I'm walking down Ohio or off Michigan Avenue. I bump into clients. And, and so they felt comfortable enough to give me shots at voiceover things. But then once I got and started in the voiceover stuff, the voiceover guys hated me because I was double dipping. I was singing on everything and now I'm doing voiceover on stuff and they were not happy and they, <laughs> I could feel it. You know, they wouldn't say anything to me, but I could just feel the, you know, the tension. Okay. It's like, why, why is this guy doing this? And you know, he's already doing all this. And, but that wasn't my thing. My thing, and I, I say this to my people that I coach and my students all the time. I've always felt that I've never really had a job. I feel like, okay, I get up and do this fun stuff. Okay, now I audition for this. And it's never work. It's just fun. And I've felt like that for 43 years now. Yeah, that really sounds like the embodiment of the phrase of, if you do something that you love, then you'll never work a day in your life. That is pretty much the, the stuff that you do on a daily basis for over 40 years, which is incredible to think about. And just, just your longevity as well. I mean, because like you said about the business being so cutthroat and stuff like that, you could have very well been tossed over to the can and just Absolutely. Uh, used for a couple of years, but but you still are alive and kicking and still doing the stuff, <laughs> which is insane. Absolutely crazy to think about. I've discovered you have to keep reinventing yourself. And that's one thing that fortunately I've been very good at. You know, when commercials started slowing down years ago, I started getting more into working with celebrities on, you know, I, I was Aretha Franklin's vocal, uh, vocal contractor for her background singer. I did part of the Stevie Wonder tour as a background singer. And one of the biggest jobs that I fell into, which was turned out to be huge. I was the vocal producer for the TV show Empire on Fox. And that was a gig that I just stumbled into again. You know, I, I knew some of the people that were involved with the show. It was being filmed in Chicago. They were bringing in music producers every week, flying them in from New York and LA. And finally someone at Fox said, there's gotta be somebody in Chicago that can do this where we're not flying people in. And uh, they started asking around and my name kept popping up. Next thing I know, I get a call from Fox. You know, we're interested in having you produce all the vocals for the artists that are appear on Empire. Can you, you know, is that something you'd be interested in? And I was like, uh, yeah, <laughs> I'd be really interested in it. So I did that season two through season six. And I was the vocal producer. I sat in the studio every day. The stars from the show would come in, Terrence Howard and uh, the, all, the, all the big stars from the show would come in and I would coach them and produce them on the songs that they were singing on the show, which would show up the next week on the TV show. So that worked out, you know, but once again, it doesn't feel like a job. It feels like I'm just, okay, now, now I'm having fun with these stars hanging out over here. <laughs> that went for, you know, those four seasons. And after that, I started doing a show on NBC that was Ordinary Joe that lasted a season, but I was a vocal producer for that show. So it's, you know, it's just doing different things. And one gets cold, and the other gets hot, the other gets cold, the other one gets hot. And so, and by doing multiple things, you kind of keep your career going. Now let's start talking about Veggie Tales, which people like me who grew up in Christian families and churches and whatnot, probably most recognize your work for that. So how was it that you first heard about Veggie Tales and how did you get involved? It's so funny. You know, I, I get a call from my agent and they say, you know, this company, Big Idea, is looking for somebody that can you know, do voiceover and sing with a kind of island accent. Is that something you can do? I was like, yeah, I can do that. That's not a problem. So I go to this little studio. They start explaining to me the character. 
I had no idea. I was probably in between three other jobs and I'm just going to do this job. And I had no idea that it was going to turn into what it turned into. They sh showed me just some uh, shots of what the character was going to look like. And I started recording. And that's how it happened. It was that, that simple. I don't know if, if you're familiar with this, but in, in the behind the scenes for the episode that you worked on, the way that Bill Fisher described it was that VeggieTales was very much a very big sleeper hit. They were killing themselves producing the very first episode, even though it wasn't a commercial success and by any means people started sending them voice tapes and they started hearing about these local guys in chicago producing the series and phil vischer described it saying that somebody who sent them a voice tape was actually you jeff morrow they soon realized that you know you did the sugar smacks thing as i brought up before phil described it just having a huge voice and they absolutely <laughs> wanted to to have you in the booth voicing for uh, paul me the palm tree that's how it happened my agent sent that tape to them the one thing that I can also recall was that the music producer for that series, Kurt Heineke, he mentioned how he felt really sort of out of place. I don't know if that's the right word, but awestruck that, you know, he was working with someone who was an actual professional, whereas Phil Vischer and Mike Naraki, you know, they weren't professionals in that industry or in that time period. So it was really crazy just working with you. And also Kurt Heineke, the music guy brought up how when you sang it the first time through, you blew it out of the water so that they didn't need you to do a second take. But since they were paying you, I think for an hour's worth of work, they said you might as well sing it again. Right, exactly. But how was it and how was this working on that song and yeah, all that stuff. Funny thing is, yeah, they weren't professionals, but they had a thing and they had that thing down. They had those characters, they had their voices down, they had exactly where they wanted that character to be portrayed and sound. And I remember doing the one take on Palmy, but the thing that I think the thing that sold them, which which was something I used to end up doing a lot on commercials too, was the laugh. <laughs> And that, that was the thing that got him. So I was like, okay, so I, I need to throw this laugh in every time, every chance I get <laughs> with, for this character, because that was a big part of that character. But they were nice, as nice as can be, great guys. Yeah, and uh, you actually were involved in one more project for Veggie Toast. That was the very Veggie Christmas album. What can you tell us about that experience? I remember thinking, okay, how is this... <laughs> How is this going to work? And then I heard the track. Dun, 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 it was a Hark the Harrow Angels sing or something like that. And I was like, oh, I see. So they had this little groove to it. It was a, it was a blast. And it was one of those things that, you know, wait a minute, I'm actually getting paid to do this. This is, this is, this is just straight up fun. It was a blast. I had a great time doing it. And once again, nicest, nicest guys. They had their thing together when I went in. The track was together. They had exactly what they wanted me to do. And they made it very easy for me. The song that you sang on was for Angels We Have Heard on High, which Angels We Have Heard on High. I knew it was something with Angels. Angels We Have Heard on High. I remember doing Oh, my God. <laughs> yeah, I remember. <laughs> no, I'm, I'm You're sorry. taking me back a lot of years now. <laughs> no, I'm just mind blown. I have the voice actor for Palmy who's singing in Palmy right in the Zoom <laughs> call. This is, oh, my God. This is insane. Absolutely crazy. And I remember they had this cool groove. Oh, 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 and they just and they gave me a lot of freedom with it. That's the thing that I remember about it. A little bit more about like the whole recording process for Veggie Tales was that during that time where they were trying to release that Christmas album, they were trying to release a Christmas show alongside it. Veggie Tales unfortunately had those really strict deadlines that they had to make. Did you ever get that feeling that you had to rush this or get this out of the way? Or was it just like a really smooth, this calm process? It was smooth, but you know, coming from the commercial world, everything is rushed. So I never noticed it because everything we do in the commercial side was, okay, this has got to be out tonight. This has got to be, so everything is like, boom, boom, boom. So I was very, and still, I'm still that way. I'm very used to coming in, working under pressure, getting it done quick, getting it done right. And being out so no i didn't feel any unusual tension because that's that was my everyday life at the time i just remembered it was easy it was they had everything set up and it was it flowed well and it was fun the one thing that that people love to bring up whenever people think of classic veggie tale songs you know it's the forgiveness song that is one that gets brought up a lot and it's also reused a lot in compilation cds and whatnot oh i didn't know you know that in love that that song yeah I remember it. I can't tell my wife that I remember all this stuff because she's going to be like, now I told you stuff yesterday <laughs> and you don't remember. But now that's something from 20 years ago and you started singing it right away. 
How crazy is it that a generation, a whole generation of kids are just going to be singing your songs, humming along with it and all sorts of things like how, how just how crazy is that? It's so funny. You know, uh, two weeks ago, I get a call from a, a producer in L.A. that wants me to do a demo for Hulu's show and it's a singing thing. And he said, I just looked at your IMDb page and you were the voice of Palm. <laughs> he said, I grew up watching. He was just so excited. But I was like, what? I was like, yeah, that was, yeah, that was, that, that was me. And so, it, 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 you know, it's fun just hearing people even now, just, you know, years and years and years later that talk so fondly about their memories and watching those uh, videos at the time and the good feelings that it brought to them. And hopefully the life, life lessons that it brought along with it. It doesn't, from what I could tell, it doesn't really sound like you received any royalties for that song though. No. And you know what? I've received royalties from so many things that sometimes it's just nice to look back and go, hey, you know, I did this. It was fun. I was paid. It was a buyout at the time. I remember that. It was uh, just one of those kind of things you just go out, walk in and do and, and done with. I was hoping that when they did the movie, I was like, well, maybe they'll stick palm me in the movie. <laughs> And then I'll start getting some residuals on this. But, you know, I've always been a, a union actor and at that time, but that was more, that was booked more like an industrial. So it was, it was okay to do that where there was no residuals or use involved. That's the way the business goes. You have things like that and you have things that are, have a ton of reuse. So did you ever hear about what happened to Big Idea? Probably in like at some points after, after working on them, like just hearing about, oh, shoot, look at what the company's up to now. Or do, are you not familiar with it? Well, I remember that they blew up. They got really big there. So I, you know, I, but I never really, uh, I didn't follow a lot because I was always busy doing, you know, 9,000 other things. So what, what did happen exactly? So let me give you a really small refresher for what happened to Big Idea. So jumping off from what you said, they blew up in 98. That was their biggest year. Mm -hmm. Mainly, I think it was because they started selling their tapes general market, whereas they used to just sell it into Christian households. Mm -hmm. But they, they started getting some small success there, where a lot of the college kids would be playing episodes of VeggieTales and people would love the, the silly songs with Larry and whatnot. Mm -hmm. But eventually what happened was that Big Idea got too big for its britches because Phil Vischer wanted to produce a movie, the Jonah one that you brought up. Right. But because they were independent and that they didn't have any big backing by any corporations, they had to start releasing more projects to help cover some of that cost. So they started releasing some other shows like uh, Three Swan Penguins and uh, Cartoon Vengeance of Larry Boy that all ultimately failed really hard. And then on top of that, the distribution company that got them to general market wanted to sue Big Idea oh for alleged breach of contract. The movies flopped. All of their plans for expansion, like all the shows flopped to hammer it even worse. They lost the lawsuit, which would later God. be overturned two years later. But regardless, <laughs> a lot went on. <laughs> yeah, definitely. But it gets even crazier. So eventually the company moves all the way down to Nashville, Tennessee in 2003. Phil Vischer, the head honcho, is not in charge of the company and is more just hired as like a voiceover writer person for a number of years. But then... After they get bought up by uh, Classic Media in 2003 from all the bankruptcy, they Classic Media gets bought up by this British company around 2007, 2006, I think. And right around that time, they release a second movie, The Pirates Who Don't Do Anything. Unfortunately, the movie flops really bad. And on top of that, the company that purchased, the parent company that bought them back in 2003 is also going through massive layoffs because they <laughs> overpurchased Big Idea's parent company. So then... They decide to fire a bunch of staff from Big Idea just as a way right. to keep the, the ship floating. And then Big Idea basically gets brought in by new management. A lot of the people that were there for the mid-2000s get fired again. And then they remain steady for a number of years until DreamWorks buys Big Idea and their company. Because that company that bought them out in 2003 actually owned a lot of quote-unquote dead assets. Mm -hmm. And DreamWorks wanted to make, what was it called? The Peabody and Sherman movie. And that company that parent company that they had had the license to the to that um to those characters so they buy them out dreamer stones veggie tales create a netflix reboot that a lot of uh fans felt was a betrayal to the source <laughs> series and stuff like that completely different run by new people but then dreamworks gets bought out by nbc veggie tales owned by dreamworks which is now owned by nbc later in 2018 comcast purchases nbc so now they're under a much bigger umbrella there is a revival series going on from like 2019 to 2021 VeggieTales show brings back all of the old people back up until the, the current day when Phil Vischer, co-creator Mike Naraki, asks DreamWorks for more hands-on positions at the company. And then they say, 
screw off, you're fired, and they completely oh kick them out God. with uh, new people voicing the characters. Oh <laughs> yeah, God. so that's a quick history lesson for what happened to VeggieTales. Well, that's an amazing history lesson because I had no idea all those things happened. But yeah, it's kind of a missed opportunity. They never brought Palmy back Woo. for uh, a movie or something like that. And I always thought that was kind of weird. I was like, why wouldn't they bring back Palmy? I'm pretty sure you would have been down to do it. Oh, I would, absolutely. You know, and I was represented at the time. I was represented by William Morris in L.A. So I, yeah, I would have been fine coming back and doing it so yeah that i'm i'm sorry it didn't happen and i was looking forward to when i heard about the movie i was like oh well maybe i know palmy's a big character character so maybe that'll happen but you know what what's meant to, for you is meant for you and what's not is is not and i've always lived by that as well and when something doesn't work out i don't worry about it it's just like okay next so in the same feature at the gone feature given the one phil also says that they were near a train line during the making of that episode and someone yelled train and then the session would basically stop and then they'd do it again did you ever experience that doing recording or just like one thing you know now that you mentioned that i remember that the studio was it's one it wasn't a studio that i worked at all the time it was a small studio and it was on the north side somewhere in chicago and i remember that yes there was a train track behind the building i don't think it happened when i was recording but i could see how that could happen because i remember where i parked walking to that studio but that's interesting and you know there some studios in chicago that would happen all the time because you get that rumble from the l and there's nothing you can do to get that to get that sound out it didn't happen specifically on my part of the session all right so now that we've kind of got the summary of veggie tales part and the voiceover work i want to transition over to you working for quite a lot of big names what can you tell us about transitioning from voiceover work to working with some of the biggest names in music it's interesting. Uh, I've always been involved with uh, the record side of it. So it wasn't really a transition. It was more of today, this is voiceover. Today I'm doing voiceover stuff. Tomorrow I'm doing record stuff. This weekend I'm out touring. So it's always been a hodgepodge of different things. I've always had that the type of situation where I didn't do just one thing. So it's always been a thing where I've had working with whether it's major artists out of Chicago doing vocal arranging and vocal production, or if it's something for a movie or if it's something for live performance, I've always done all those different things. What were some of the things that you did when you were part of some of these, these artists? Cause I remember that you said that you did some vocal coaching working in in the studio sometimes you would do tours and stuff like that is how mm -hmm. crazy was those experiences knowing that you're working with you know like stevie wonder who you brought up was a big influence when you were growing up or aretha franklin jay-z and uh, those kinds of people my favorite is aretha aretha was very tough to work with but she liked me <laughs> So it made it made my job easy. And she was she was one of these people that she really didn't talk much to the background singers, but she would talk to the leader of the background singers, which was which I was leading the the group. She was always just very serious. Retha didn't play around much and there was not any, you know, fun hang time, but she was a consummate pro and always a joy to work with. You might not have known what songs were gonna be called on that show or on that set because she would just kind of shift away from sets at different times kind of had your your nerves on end because you were hoping it was something that the group knew well that could cover the background parts even though you know she has a gazillion songs the stevie wonder tour happened i wasn't the contractor on it a friend of mine was a contractor on it and called me about working on the tour once again consummate pro it was easy walking in you knew the songs it was everything was laid out and everything was very very organized with the stevie tours as far as record stuff a very famous artist out of chicago i did a ton of work for for about 15 years on every song that the artist had that was kind of more world or spiritual based the artist was a very controversial artist out of Chicago, which I probably don't have to say any, anymore. But he had two sides of his work that he would do. He would do the club kind of R&B songs, but then he would do these more spiritual kind of things, and they would be on the same album. And so whenever he did the spiritual types of songs, I was in with a group that formed the backgrounds for those songs. So for years, I worked with that artist out of Chicago, who also took a lot of his songs. After he would do the demos, they were sold to other artists. So I would hear songs that I worked on with that artist, and I would hear Ruben Studdard, or I would hear him and uh, Jay-Z on the same project, or Trisha Yearwood, or Celine Dion. And they would be songs that I worked on 
and arrange the background vocals for and produce the background vocals for. This goes back to that just being diversified, keeping one foot in the commercials, one foot in the voiceover, one foot in the records, and another foot in live performance. That has worked out uh, really well for me over the years. Students that I coach now, I always say, don't, don't rely on one thing. That one thing is going to get stale. That one thing is going to go cold. Then what are you going to do? What's going to happen then if that's, if you are depending on this for your income, if you're doing this full time and this is your business, then you better diversify. You better have a few things that you do and not just one thing. You know, one of the people that kind of controversial, but you know, this person, really big celebrity brought up in Chicago, Kanye West. Yay, as people know of him. I find it kind of crazy that, you know, both of you guys being from the same city that I don't think, maybe I might be wrong, but I don't think that you guys have ever run into each other. I've never worked with Kanye. Never. I've had friends, but I think a lot of the, the vocal stuff that he did, he did outside of Chicago. I've never worked with him. And I was, I was actually pretty surprised when, cause I would think about it, you know, when he did Jesus walking, I'm like, oh, that would I would have been perfect to you know produce backgrounds on that. But I don't think it was done in Chicago. I think it was done in LA. So yeah, I've never worked with Kanye. What can you tell us about you being involved in so many practices from recording voices, advertisements, and the music industry? What are like the good sides to those businesses, but also some of the darker underbellies? You have to learn early on that when you audition for something, audition and then forget it. A lot of people get caught up in, okay, I did this audition. I know I was perfect for it. I'm waiting to hear from them and I'm sitting by the phone. I learned very early in my career that you audition, you forget about it because it will drive you crazy worrying about it. And I think this also goes back to the point of having other things to keep you, you busy and tied up. So you're not sitting thinking about that one thing that you didn't get or you're hoping that you get. As far as the underside of the business, I've been very, very blessed and very, very fortunate. I have not had to deal with a lot of craziness or a lot of issues. And I think it's, there's something about my demeanor and it's not that I mean, I just, I have a serious kind of face. When <laughs> I have a, I have a pretty serious face. And so people don't bring mess to me. My career has always been that way. If they're doing stuff that's legit, if they're doing stuff that's business is correct, they bring it to me. If they're doing something that's shady and they're ducking and dodging, they're not involving me. And that's one of the big blessings I've had with this career. I mean, commercials, I've always been on the union side. I'm sag after. I don't have to go in negotiating anything. I don't have to go in talking about money. You go in, these are the rates. Unless they're offering over scale, those are the rates and I know what I'm getting and I don't have to deal with any problems with it. So I've been very, very fortunate. Record side of the business, a little different because a lot of those, a lot of record sessions, matter of fact, all of them. And I'm in the latest, one of the latest things I, I've just, I just did last year was the movie Rise about the basketball player was on, I don't know what, what network was on. I think it was Hulu or something like that. It's one of those things where you work on production. That's not part of after SAG. So that's something I have to negotiate more. Same thing working on TV shows. I have to set a rate and it's not set by union. People have always been very fair with me and I've never had any issues. I've never been ripped off or anything. I've never been not paid for anything. I've never had that happen in my career. So I've been really blessed in that, in that way. I remember when you recently posted this earlier this year, which I don't know, to me just felt like it was a step in the right direction to bringing in, bringing in some positivity against all of like the, the terrible stuff that we hear on the news every day. But you were involved in uh, Carnegie Hall doing this event where a lot of famous musicians and singers would be singing songs from people who survived the Holocaust and they sang these, these songs and then you and a bunch of other people would be doing that. And to me, it, I just felt that whenever it's like you're losing hope and that maybe things aren't progressing as they should be, or maybe that we're, we're still stuck in the dark ages and that there's no light. When I see something like that, it just affirms to me that not everybody is evil and not everyone in this world is out to try to, to get certain things back to, to the way they should when we should be moving past certain things. Yes, this is a scary time in life. You know, and I find myself wondering, I was thinking about this last night, as I get up in age, I'm wondering, what is this country going to be like for my kids now? And 20 years from now, banning books and cutting African-American studies and, you know, just all these crazy things that I would have never thought that would come back around again are all of a sudden rearing its ugly head again. So I think the country is strong enough and there are, like you are saying, there's enough good people that we're going to be able to weather this and things are going to get back on a track of peace and love and, you know, respect 
for individuals and individuals, races and race, religion, ethnicity. And I'm praying that that's what's going to happen. It's a, it's a very strange time we're living in right now. A lot of people, I think they would just be like, oh, that's just like a cool little experience that you did. Not everybody gets to be at Carnegie Hall. You've done so much cool things about that. But what was that experience about? Because I feel like that experience was probably a lot more significant. Or maybe that's just my bias kind of showing. It was very, very significant. It was just a heartwarming experience overall. And the way I got involved, a really good friend of mine, Ira Antelis, he was one of the writers that wrote a lot of the songs that were involved in this production. He's also the guy that wrote Be Like Mike for the commercial. And so I've known him forever. We've worked together for many, many years. And he said, you know, I'd really love to have you in this. And I had to read a, a certain a part that was in the song and I had to sing in, in the song. And it was just a touching, such a heartfelt experience seeing some of the survivors that were there and, and the families and just hearing the pride and the messages in those songs and thinking, wow, I'm actually involved in this and I'm singing at Carnegie Hall and this is, this is, this is amazing. So it was a very heartwarming experience. I'm willing to bet that in your over 40 years of doing this sort of thing, that that probably wasn't just the only like super significant thing that you've done. So can you tell us uh, some more really significant moments, whether it was, I don't know, advertisements, voice acting, or just being involved similar to to that thing, what are some other stuff that you've done? Yeah, I've done so many things over the years. I've done projects for supporting Ukraine. I've done, you know, civil rights projects over the years for some for TV shows and some for advertising. So it's just so many, I can't even remember. It's just, and you know, some of these things start to kind of blur into other things. The Carney Hall experience just stood out just head and shoulders. And, you know, and also the excitement of being in New York and walking in the Carnegie Hall and looking out at that from the stage and just, ugh, just, just an amazing experience. But I've done, I've done tons of things over the years. What can you tell us about your family and your children and all that amazing legacy that you, you have? I have a, my wonderful wife, uh, Anita. She's in Big Pharma. She's a director at Eli Lilly. That's how I ended up in Indianapolis because they're head, headquartered here. And I have my oldest daughter is a former dancer in Lion King. She lives in Los Angeles area now. My second daughter is hair and makeup on Saturday Night Live. And she also does a lot of movies in New York. So she's in New York. So I have one in New York, one in LA. And I have a son in Phoenix and and he's uh, works for Amazon. And I have a son in Atlanta. My So those are all four of my kids. and. The youngest son just graduated last year from uh, Morehouse University. Morehouse College, I'm sorry. They're all doing great, and I'm very proud of all of them, all, all of my kids. Uh, they're doing nice things, doing interesting things. I also have three stepdaughters, uh, my wife's daughters, that are also spread out all over the country. One's in San Francisco. One, she owns a company there, and one is a pastry chef for Microsoft. And uh, the other is going into her doctoral program at Northwestern next year. So they're all doing great things. So I'm very, we're very proud of all the kids. I'm enjoying being, you know, I enjoy Chicago. I enjoy being in the city, but I'm also enjoying being out of, a, out of such a big city and into a little smaller city now in Indianapolis and going to Chicago when I need to, to work or just working online when I have to work. So it's a nice experience. It's a nice change of pace for me here. Yeah, I need to give a shout out to your daughter, Ebony for setting me up with this amazing interview with yes. the one and only Jeff Morrow. So thanks, Ebony. You're amazing. Yes, she is. She's a, she's a hard worker. That's the one that's the dancer. So yeah, that's Ebony. But yeah, she she handled it. And she's as excited. She said, Dad, I can't wait to hear how it goes. It sounds like it's going to be fun. That's like, I'll let you know. <laughs> I'm sure it'll be fun. You know, I almost completely missed this one big part of your career. I mean, New Thing, I think it was. New, new Thing Productions. Oh, New Voice. New Voice, I'm sorry, yeah, New Voice Productions. I mean, how does that thing get started and how is it going right now? New Voice Productions is what I use. It's the entity that I use when I do TV production as a vocal producer and arranger. So it's been going really well over the past few years. I have a New Voice production and I also have a Chicago Music Group, which is with a good friend of mine, Rich Daniels. And we do a, we do, we handle a lot of TV things. And when, when that pops up and we're busy with that. So it's, it's going smooth. Television shows are in such a flux right now. There's, you know, there's things pop up and you're working on two or three different shows where you're doing, you know, 
know, a few songs in this show. And then all of a sudden everything goes away. Just like uh, when I was talking about commercials and records and all that. It's up and down and up and down, but we stay pretty busy. So New Voices is a fun little production side that I work on. One of the things that stuck out to me was you working with Jordan Peele, his upcoming movie, I think it was, Lovecraft Country. Yes. How does it feel to be working with one of the greatest directors of seemingly this generation, let alone, you know, such a household African-American director? Amazing. And just the talent there is just crazy. I'm, and I was just so thrilled to work on that show. And I got to work on the first episode where the characters were singing and at a street festival, I got called in to work with Journey Smollett and Wumi. And they were amazing to work with. And, you know, it's just such a great show. And the funny thing is Wumi, who was one of the sisters on the show, and she was playing guitar and singing. And I had to work with them dancing and singing and getting and recording their songs. Then I get home and I start watching uh, Brit Box and I see that she's <laughs> she's on all kinds of shows in Britain, and which I had no idea that she was that big of a deal. I knew that Journey Smollett was very big here on a bunch of different shows. And they were just the nicest people to work with. And so that was a very wonderful experience working on that show. So apparently, according to your Instagram, it says you worked on the Halo theme song which is very iconic. Yes. Can you elaborate on how you got into that Halo project? You know, once again, that's that's one of those things I'm working, doing multiple sessions in a day, and I get a, a call from a company called Salvatore, Salvatore and O'Donnell. And I figured it was just a regular commercial session. And it was the theme for that game. It was a interesting session because I remember that it was, you know, very intricate, the, the, the singing. And we had a blast. And I was like, this is for, what, what commercials is this for? I was like, oh no, this is for, the game halo this is you're gonna you know it's gonna be playing all all the time in the game and it was a very unique experience and a very enjoyable experience and uh, it was myself bob bowker who i mentioned earlier and mike and marty the guys that owned the company and we were the guys that sang on that song and it you know it's been really good for a lot of years wow that's amazing over your ten thousand commercials that you've worked for which one would you say would it's like more morally like questionable or like you don't really uh like you loved all of them. Here's the thing. Whenever I was called to do something that I thought was just morally wrong, I can remember a couple of things, a couple of sessions early on in my career. Someone called me for, there were these little things that little toys and these toys that had little buttons on them. And I was called to do like beatbox sounds on this, on this little thing, those kind of things. But then as the session progresses, they want me to do little sayings and the sayings were cursing. And I was like, look, man, I've got kids and I don't want anybody saying that's your dad on that thing cursing it. And so I, I wouldn't do it. I refused. So I've never had any things that I found that were just that I've done that I felt was just morally wrong because I just won't do it. Thank God I've been busy enough where I don't have to do anything that I don't want to do and I wouldn't do it. So I've just had, you know, and I, when I look at my career, I look at just, I've just, I've been really blessed to have worked with some great people over the years and have done some amazing projects. And I'm thankful every day for that, that I can look back, even though people, a lot of people don't remember a lot of things that I've done. They're all still alive and well on YouTube and I can go back and l listen to them and laugh and watch the old grainy video. <laughs> On the show Empire that you worked at, I found this out last week. One of the people who voiced Dad Asparagus on Veggie Tales actually was on an episode of Empire, apparently. Who was that? Dan Anderson. He said that he played an FBI agent in one of the episodes where they were raiding the house of one of the characters, I believe. And in the background, he was actually one of the agents, which is <laughs> absolutely crazy. That is so funny. You know, that show kept so many people working in Chicago. And it was funny, since I was in the studio, the studio was connected to the set, kind of. It was like right down the street. So I would be in the studio all day, and the stars would just walk down the street, and then I would record them on the songs. And then sometimes I would walk back down the street and watch them film a scene in the little pods that they had there. But so many people were on that show. And I, you know, and I was fortunate enough to bring, I was at the time I was also teaching at uh, Roosevelt University and Columbia College teaching voice. And I was able to bring a lot of my students into that show as background singers on in scenes and things like that. So a lot of people worked on that show that I would never see because I wasn't on a lot of the remote locations because I was stuck in the studio. But that is so funny. Yeah, I'm not surprised with that by that though. 
Yeah, I remember I asked him last week. I was like, was it possible that you ran into Jeff Marr? But he was like, no, because like what you said, you were in the studio working with the, the stars. Right. So you weren't actually there on set to, to see any of that. But I still find that to be a really cool, obscure connection yes. still. Seven degrees of separation. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, that's, yeah, that's exactly it. You know, Mr. Morrow, it has been absolutely such a pleasure just, just listening to you, just recall all of your experiences and uh, all of your incredible perspectives. You're just such a kind, very humble soul. It's just absolutely amazing that that you've taken time out of your very busy schedule just to be talking with me and my co-host, Mr. Lunch. Absolutely. It's been a pleasure. I'm just so baffled. I just, I'm talking to this guy who's done so many great things and he's listening to, to little old me, just, just asking him some questions about all the stuff that he's worked on. But it's been an absolute pleasure being with you. And I hope for nothing but the absolute best for all of your future endeavors. Pleasure has been all mine, believe me. And thank you for having an interest in the things that I've done over the years that, you know, you, as an old guy, you think, ah, eh, all that stuff I've done, nobody cares about that anymore. So I really appreciate that. And you, you made an old guy feel really good today. Absolutely. Thank you so much. All right. Uh, take care, Mr. Mar. We'll see you on the flip side. All right. Thank you, guys. I'd like to thank Jeff Morrow for taking part in this interview. And a big shout out goes to his daughter, Ebony, for setting up this amazing interview. You can find Jeff and all of his happenings by following him on Facebook and Instagram. Big thanks also goes out to my co-host, Mr. Lunch, for all of the additional research as well. And until next time, we'll see you guys on the next What's the Big Idea podcast. Hi there. My name is Jeff Morrow, the voice of Palmy the Palm Tree from Veggie Tales. And you're listening to the What's the Big Idea podcast. Hehehehe! <laughs>